It's episode 10 of the Build a Real Robot series. We'll start by clearing up a wiring error from last time, then we'll look at the project status. I'll show you some of the new wiring I've done, and we'll take a look at some of the sensors that we'll be adding to DB1. Get ready for episode 10, and welcome to the workshop. Hello and welcome to the workshop and to episode 10 of the series on how to build a real robot. And for this episode, I'm going to take a break from the motor controller, especially because I haven't really had a lot of time to write software for it. I actually took a couple of days off last weekend, believe it or not. It's the first time I've done that this year. Uh, really did need it. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on around here, not only in the workshop, but also around the neighborhood we've been experiencing a flooding situation which fortunately is receding we had a couple of nice days on the weekend and when you consider in the month of april we had 26 days of rain out of the 30 days of the month a couple of nice days was too much for me to resist so i took a few days off that's why i didn't have a drone bot workshop episode last weekend i apologize for that but i was out getting a bit of sunshine and now i'm back here in the workshop with db1 I haven't done a lot in terms of programming the controller, but I have done some wiring and I'm going to show you the wiring. But what I also want to do is to start off by talking about wiring, talking about a mistake I made in the last episode. In the last episode, I showed you the wiring of the motor controller with the two Arduino Nanos. Well, I had the VCC going to the wrong place. I had it going to the VIN pin, pin 30 on the nanos and that is incorrect it should be going to the 5 volt pin which is pin 27 on the nanos so i've made that wiring change on mine i've made the change on the diagram on the dronebotworkshop.com website and i apologize for doing that and thank you so much for those who immediately pointed out the error because it wouldn't have been a serious like oh my god something's going to catch fire error this is more of a oh something isn't going to work properly error because the VIN pin goes before the voltage regulator so the 5 volts needs to come after that so it goes to the 5 volt pin. Now having said that the it really convinced me that really I want to build this controller out of AT Megas instead of out of uh, the two um, nanos that I'm using right now. The AT Mega 328P chip is really the way to do it. And on that, i am actually got a breadboard over here. And I don't know if you can see that. I've got uh, a couple of sockets on it that I'm just sort of spacing out, plus another socket for another integrated circuit. So I'm going to put two AT Mega 328Ps on here to replace my motor controller and have the other jacks in the same place on the circuit board. Now, if you've already built this out of nanos, don't worry. I'm going to continue to develop using the nanos, but when I have the other board ready, I'm going to replace it. I might even turn the other board into to a printed circuit board at some point because I know a lot of you would probably find it a lot easier to construct DB1 if you had a printed circuit board. What I decided we would do today since I didn't really write a lot of code for this is I'll show you the wiring I've done. I have done some wiring on here so I want to show you that but I also want to discuss where we are going with this project. Now right now we are working on the base. It's the navigation unit of DB1 and after we do this, after we get the motor controller working and talking to the Arduino Mega over I2C, we're going to move on to start adding sensors. Now the sensors I'm talking about are navigation sensors. I want to make that clear because if you remember, DB1 has a tower. It's also got a whole sensor platform over here. Plus it will have a platform on the top that we'll talk about in a moment. But those platforms are primarily 
for different sensors. Those are for the environmental sensors. Those are for the intelligent sensors, the things that do things like object recognition and that. Right now, the sensors we are working with on the navigation layer are really the ones that do things like collision detection. And that's what we're going to be doing next. And that's going to also involve some wiring on the tower because we want to put navigation sensors up on the tower as well. We don't want to just build a robot that can see down on floor level because after all, I mean, it could look under a table, think it has plenty of space to go when in reality it's going to hit its top on it. So it needs sensors up and down. So um, the next step we're going to be doing after all of this then is going to be with all the different sensors. And I'm going to show you again how I'm going to be using the same principle I'm using for the motor controller and that the sensors are all going to go to intelligent controllers and those in turn are going to talk to the Arduino Omega over here. The Omega is really kind of a manager to manage all of the stuff that goes around it. So let's take a look at the wiring right now and then after that I want to show you a few of the other devices that are eventually going to go on to DB1 both on this navigation layer and on to the other layer of sensors and that because I thought that would be interesting to do as well. So first let's take a look at the little bits of wiring I did here. So here's a bit of the wiring I've done since we last looked at DB1. It all centers on the motor controller board, which as you can see is powered up now. I've got it all powered up to the umbilical cord. And I've got some wires going to the Cytron motor controllers. Uh, Cytron's kind enough to include a connector for their end of the motor controller and uh, this other end is just a JST connectors that I've been using for the whole design. It's a three pin one. So I've got three pin cables coming out to give the PWM and the DUR signals to the Cytron motor controller. And I've also got uh, cables running down to the rotary encoders on the motors going back to the rotary encoder inputs and of course I've got the power connection done as well and as you can see I've got the two nanos on there one of them is actually running the blink sketch at the moment now if you look over at uh, my mega you can see it's powered and something I've added over here let me just take it off for a second I've added a USB connector and connected it back over to here to power the mega through a small USB cable and the reason I did that is that it's actually the better way of powering something like a mega for that matter it's a better way of powering something like a nano as well which is another reason why I want to move my controller design to an AT mega 328 but for the mega by powering it this way I get the advantage of the small protection circuitry that they have for the five volts coming in over here there's a small pico fuse arrangement and it's also a good way of of powering it and not getting into the conflict I'm going to have over here. If I connect a uh, computer here to program one of these chips, I have to have the 5 volts off over here or at least removed on the fuse bank because I don't want the two power supplies to conflict. With this arrangement, I won't have any such um, problem. And once the motor controller is programmed, I don't anticipate having to control it very often. And as I said, I'm going to move to an AT Mega 328 based design anyway. But this I can see needing to program quite often. So this is sort of an extra measure of safety as well. I can't be powering it from the 5 volts and my computer at the same time using this arrangement over here. And so that's basically the wiring that I've done. It's not a lot, but it has everything we need to get working with our motor controllers, which is what we will do the next time we get together. So now you've seen some of the wiring that I did on DB1 since we last met. I wanted to talk about some of the devices we are going to be placing onto DB1. Now the things we've been working on so far have been with the navigation layer and that's what we're going to continue to work on. The sensors I was talking about before are also part of the navigation layer. Now most of the navigation layer is in the base but there is of course a need to go up to the tower and place some navigation sensors 
sensors because we want to be able to sense things all over the robot, not just on its base. But as we go up into the tower, we have other sensors to place as well that aren't part of the navigation. If I might remind you, this bottom layer over here is going to be for the intelligence circuitry, uh, the brains of the robot, if you wish. And this is going to be for the environment and sensing. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of sensors over here. There's also going to be a platform on top over here. Now I've got some more plexiglass here. I'm going to cut this down about here because I don't want it this wide and place it on top. And that's going to carry a number of sensors as well as the crowning achievement of the entire project. And that would be this. Now we've seen this before. This is the LiDAR sensor and it's going to mount on the plexiglass on the top of the robot and it's going to be able to map out the entire room but that's not part of the navigation. That is part of the environmental sensing so I want to make sure we differentiate between the two of them. Some other sensors we're going to be working with while well, I got you out over here and some other additions as well. First of all, in terms of additions, now you know I'm going to be using a card like this in order to wire on top of the Mega over here, which is basically our controller or our manager. I'm not sure if I'm going to use this one or another one similar to it. I'm looking at some other styles. I've ordered a few different ones and I'll pick the one I like. But this just lets me add some custom connectors in order to connect all of the other elements to the uh, Mega. Now, I'm going to be doing most of my connections through I2C. And one thing I was looking at is this I2C multiplexer. Now, this actually splits out the I2C bus and creates four other I2C buses. And that has some advantages because the I2C bus was, after all, the inter-integrated circuit bus. It was really meant for sending signals along the length of a circuit board, not several meters of cable. And so since I'm going to have a lot of cabling throughout the tower, into the front of the robot, I wanted to kind of divide it off so that nothing was going on be uh, more than one meter, which is kind of the maximum they say you should run the I2C bus at. Now I'm looking at another system as well, which doesn't use a card like this, but would just use a number of bus repeaters. But at any rate, I want to make sure I've got nice, strong, clean signals. And to that effect, I've purchased this. This is uh, two different types of shielded data cable. It's shielded. One of them is six conductor, one is four conductor. The four conductor is obviously going to be very good for I2C connections. Six conductor I have a reason for. Now those of you with eagle eyes will be able to see that I've got some connectors on the tower over here. This is actually going to be used to distribute both I2C and an interrupt and an emergency stop signal. There's six conductor connectors and that's how I'm going to get things up to the tower and also to the front of the robot and that's why I have the six conductor shield of cable over here. So there's a lot of wiring that's going to need to take place for the navigation sensors. Now some of the other things that you're going to see wired onto here is this little LiDAR sensor. Now we've used this before and this is going to be actually part of the navigation layer, not of the uh, sensor and environmental layer. This is actually going to be used, it's going to be probably the most sophisticated thing that we use on the navigation layer to determine if there's anything blocking our path. And it's going to be mounted, not down on the base, but up on the front over here on one of those uh, type of a swivel and uh, pivot type of mounts so it can be moved around. And that way it should be able to get a good view of everything that's in front of the robot. Another sensor that a lot of people have asked about is the pixie cam and I definitely will be finding a way to incorporate the pixie cam. I'm not sure entirely how I'm going to use the pixie cam and whether it's going to be part of the environmental or navigation layer. It's sort of a for later type of thing but I am making space for the pixie cam. What I am going to be using is the open MV cam. Now this is going to be part of the environmental and sensing layer, not part of the navigation layer. So it'll be a while before we use this. Now this is the M7, which there's actually an M8 right now, and I'm on a waiting list for the M8, but 
This is an intelligent camera like the Pixie Cam. This is actually a lot more intelligent in many respects. It has a very high speed, high bandwidth processor over here. It also uses a camera that has lenses that are interchangeable. You can get fish eyes, infrared, etc. So there's a lot of uh, possibilities for this. And this is going to be part of the environmental and sensing layer. So I just wanted to give you a look at a few of the things we're going to be using in the DB1 project as we go on. Now I'm going to get back to writing some code so next week we can actually look at some code to make the motor controllers work. So once again I thank you very much for joining me. There is an accompanying article on the dronebotworkshop.com website which includes the correction for the wiring for the motor controllers so make sure if you're wiring those up you observe that correction. And as always I would like you to take care of yourselves and I hope to see you again very soon here in the workshop. Goodbye for now.